Chapter Twenty Seven of Wise and Otherwise. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Wise and Otherwise by Pansy. Chapter Twenty Seven. The Wise in Heart will receive commandments. You might as well talk to a stone wall, Judge Benson said, as the officers of the Regent Street Church wended their crestfallen way homeward. What is the trouble with him, Brother Osborne? Something seems to be wrong. The main trouble, I think, is that he has managed to get himself wedged in between Christ and the cross, so naturally he thinks of himself first. Let's go in and see Sales a few moments, Dr. Douglas said, pausing in front of his friend's door. He was anxious to hear the result of this. So they all went in. Mr. and Mrs. Sales were alone together in the parlor, and the story of the call was gone over for their benefit. I don't know about it at all, Judge Benson said, growing a little excited. We seem to be crippled constantly in our efforts for the good of the church. I'm half inclined to think if we can't agree to work together comfortably as pastor and people, perhaps it would be well to agree to separate. What a woebegone face, Mrs. Sales! Is it wicked for a church to make a change of pastors? It is a very solemn thing, I think, Mrs. Sales said, speaking gravely and one which should not be entered on without much thought and prayer, and a settled conviction of the necessity of such a step. Judge Benson turned toward Mr. Osborne. There would be fewer changes than there are nowadays, Brother Osborne, would there not, if Mrs. Sale's ideas were lived up to? And much less need of them, the old man said earnestly. She is right. We must speak softly about this matter. Indeed, I don't know that we ought to speak at all. Oh, my words were light, I'll admit, said Judge Benson. I've never spoken them before, and yet I confess I have thought them occasionally, but I dare say I am wrong. He is a good preacher, and he tries to do good in certain quarters. And accomplishes it, too, said Mrs. Sales. He has done a great deal for the Morrisons. No one ever had so much influence over them before. And he is very much in earnest about Sabbath school work, chimed in her husband. Yes, yes, old Mr. Osborne said. He is in earnest about a good many things. Don't let us go and get obstinate because he doesn't always see things just exactly as we do. He is doing work for the master in his way, and maybe it's just as good a way as ours. Anyway, as the dear sister has said, we must remember it is a solemn thing for us to find fault with one whom we have so solemnly covenanted to help, and by whose counsel we are pledged to walk so far as we can. About this meeting now, he may be right and we wrong. We cannot tell. Let us walk softly. The Lord will show us each the right way if we will let him. Do you think, Brother Osborne, that we should give up the idea of attending these meetings? Oh, no, no. I wouldn't give up these meetings, it seems to me, unless the Lord should tell me that I must. I look forward to them with a great joy. But I'll tell you what seems best to do. We'll just slip quietly into them, not as a church, you know, but as Christians. We'll get all the dear people to go that we can, especially those who have no acquaintance with our Savior, and we'll do all the good we can. But we'll do it kind of quietly, without saying or thinking anything about opposition, or want of sympathy, or any of those harsh words. And we'll not neglect our own meetings, only we'll just try to have a good precious time, such as the Lord loves us to have. Isn't that the way? "'Yes,' said Judge Benson emphatically, rising as he spoke. "'I'm glad I came in here this evening. "'Brother Sales, your wife and our brother Osborne between them, "'have quite subdued me. "'I'll have to admit that I was in rather a turbulent state of mind. "'Left to myself, I'm not sure but I should have advocated "'calling the church together and proposed an insurrection. "'Let us all pray the good Lord to save us from ourselves,' "'Mr. Osborne said, with a sort of tender solemnity, as he shook hands all around and made ready to take his leave. As for Mr. Tresevant, he was not by any means as happy as a triumphant man might have been supposed to be. He went from the conference with his brethren to his own room in a perturbed state of mind. Perplexities surrounded him on every hand. His heart was heavy. He wanted a different state of things in his church, desired it greatly. At least he thought so. He believed in revivals, although he had so decidedly entered his protest against what he was pleased to term forced ones. If he had admitted to himself what was the solemn truth, that he did not believe in anything that was in danger of thrusting him into the background, if only he had realized this, 
the unchristian thought would have startled him, led him perhaps into an examination of his own heart. If some one could have said to him, See here, you don't want to attend these proposed meetings, you don't want your church to attend them, because you think that in the event of a revival the people will become deeply interested in the old minister, will talk about and love him, and will forget all about you and their duty to you. And then after those words, if that plain-spoken individual could have immediately faded into thin air and been seen no more, I think it would have done Mr. Tresevant good. But if the speaker had remained flesh and blood, a person to be met and endured, I fear me that Mr. Tresevant's haughty anger would have prevented any benefit to himself. Ah, me, if instead of this idle fancy he would have gone to some quiet spot, and, kneeling, said, Dear Master, show me my own heart, show me wherein I am wrong, lead me in thy way. What might not this petition have done for the pastor of the Regent Street Church? Instead he paced the floor of his room, looking moody, and dwelling on all that had been unpleasant to him in the conversation, until his heart grew sore and angry against them all, and he said firmly, I will not be coaxed or pressed into doing what I do not wish to do. It is true he had family worship. Presently, and during his prayer, he said, Grant that our every wish may be made subservient to thy honor and glory. And he did not in the least realize that while he was speaking those words, he was thinking, How very annoying it was that Dr. Douglas must be mixed up with everything. He went presently to the spot that always calmed him down, his special shrine whereat he almost worshipped. That was the new and dainty piece of furniture that had lately been introduced into his home life, a lace-canopied, rose-lined crib. Within that crib lay sleeping a fair-faced, dimpled baby, the first-born to the house of Tresevant. Roswell C. Tresevant. Can anybody describe what that bit of dainty flesh and blood meant to the young father bending over him, and drinking in all the sweetness and purity of that lovely face? Joy, pride, exaltation reveled in the father's gaze. And still there loomed up before him that all-powerful I. My son, my precious one, I will do thus and so for him. I will have this and that prepared for him. And very rarely indeed did there come to Mr. Tresevant such a sense of his own frailty and powerlessness that he longed to lay his treasure in stronger arms than his, and pray the all-powerful father to call him his child. So on this particular evening he stood beside the crib, thinking his strong, eager thoughts, until the unpleasantness of the evening faded, I and the responsibilities also, and he gave himself up to the delights of a triumphant future. Meantime the Regent Street pastor did not succeed in blocking the wheels of the Park Street Church. He did not announce the meetings, and he did announce his own regular appointments for the week as usual. But the meetings across the way commenced, and the Regent Street people, following the advice and example of old Mr. Osborne, slipped quietly in, coming in larger numbers every evening, coming with deepening interest, and many of them after earnest closet prayer, until toward the close of the first week, had Mr. Tresevant chosen to be present, he might have met almost his entire Sabbath congregation. There is not space to tell you of the blessed meeting that this people enjoyed, and indeed it would be a difficult matter to report it. To have had any idea of the preciousness, you must have been present and felt its power. But there were two special evenings concerning which I want to tell you. Mr. Tresevant had not planned utterly to absent himself from the Park Street Church, on the contrary, his intention had been to be present frequently, both to avoid attracting attention and to keep himself posted as to the movements of his own people. Yet he felt a strange reluctance to make one of the number who nightly thronged the church, and allowed the most trivial engagements, the most commonplace excuses, to detain him. So it came to pass that more than a week had the meetings continued before he made one of the congregation. On that particular evening both he and Mrs. Tresevant were present. The house was crowded to its utmost capacity. Mr. Tresevant declined an invitation to the pulpit, and pushed his way into an obscure corner near the door. His position gave him a full view of the aged saint upon whose words the people hung, and before that evening's sermon had been concluded he ceased to be astonished at the old minister's power over his audience. Quiet, steady-toned, simple, solemn, with that rare argumentative tone which his particularly logical and scholarly mind gave to all his sermons. 
it seemed well nigh impossible to withstand the direct, searching truth. In vain Mr. Tresevant listened for the loud tones and wild flights of fancy that he imagined would be used to rouse people to the highest pitch of excitement. The speaker's voice seemed no louder than an ordinary conversational one, and the audience were as quiet and solemn as if the very solemnity of the grave itself hovered over them. Those who have heard the aged, honored saint of whom I speak know that one of his peculiar powers as a preacher lies in leaving open his hearers the solemn conviction that it is impossible to avoid the conclusions that have been thus quietly and logically forced upon them, that reason and common sense alike demand their acceptance, that it would be beyond even human folly to deny them. Yet there is more than all this in the man. There is in his face, in his words, in his tones, I, in his very movements, a quiet, restful, pervading sense of being sustained and guided and uplifted by a power out of and beyond himself. It was to such a sermon, delivered by such a man, that Mr. Tresevant listened that evening. What wonder that he ceased to be surprised at results! Yet his heart was not in accord with the spirit of the meeting. How could it be, when a Christian deliberately, and for selfish reasons, holds himself aloof from the sacred and holy influences by which he might be surrounded? Is it to be supposed that on his first coming into their midst the Spirit of God will delight to take up his abode in that closed heart? Indeed, a strange feeling that the poor beset man would not have dared to own was disappointment, took possession of him as, looking around upon the audience, he saw one and another and another of the people who belonged nominally to the Regent Street congregation, people who never came to church, never evinced any interest in religion, and yet they were here to-night. They hardly ever heard me preach in their lives, he said to himself in bitterness, and yet they crowd here to-night. And he gave himself up to moody thoughts over, not his own failures, he never failed, but over the stupidity of people. It was from such thoughts as these that he was suddenly aroused by the mention of his own name. The aged minister had spied him from his seat behind one of the columns. They had met several days before. Mr. Parker knew of the young clergyman things which his own heart did not suspect. Ever on the alert to do good, this veteran in the cause determined to try to draw the young officer forward. There was a very general movement in the audience. Evidently they had been invited to kneel for prayer, though Mr. Tresevant, brooding over his own thoughts, had not heard the request. It was repeated. Let us all kneel so far as it is possible, and will our brother Tresevant come forward here and lead us in a brief prayer for the special descent of the Holy Spirit? Mr. Tresevant hesitated, his face flushing painfully. To refuse to pray would certainly be a strange thing for a Christian minister to do, yet he was conscious of feeling very little of the spirit of prayer. Besides, to his morbid fancy, the call forward seemed made for the purpose of drawing him into special and unpleasant notice. Around the altar were Dr. Willis, Dr. Henry, Mr. Carland, and several other of the pastors of different churches, already kneeling, and the kneeling congregation were already waiting reverently for someone to lead their petitions up to the throne. Mr. Tresevant arose hurriedly. He had decided not to go forward, not to kneel. He would be heard quite as well from where he stood. There was no use in marching down that long aisle. He was not in the habit of kneeling when he led in prayer in his own church. Why should he do so here? It was much more natural and unaffected for him to maintain his usual posture. Thus he reasoned, even while he prayed, not especially for the descent of the Holy Spirit, but that no one's mind might be carried away by undue excitement, that none should make the awful mistake of supposing emotion to be religion, that all might realize that religion was an everyday matter, not something to be put into a few days or weeks of unusual nervous strain and then forgotten. Such was the spirit and tenor of the prayer to which the great congregation listened. There were some present, members of the Regent Street Church, who did not follow the words of this petition, but who prayed with strong inward cryings and with tears for their pastor, that he might not be permitted to do injury to the cause. There was no distressing silence at the conclusion of Mr. Tresevant's prayer, wherein he remembered various benevolent societies and the numerous missions in foreign lands. The low, clear voice of Mr. Parker followed close upon the Amen, and his first words were, Lord, teach us how to pray, right here and now, for these waiting hungry souls. 
one posture is as good as another said mr tresevant sourly to himself as he made his way out of the church i don't believe in making so much of forms but is one spirit as good as another poor foolish sheep that you should be so willing to make so much of forms and postures as to persistently cling to your own in the face of a gentle request from a gray-haired minister of christ to take some other in the face of a great kneeling congregation thus his conscience tried to say to him but he was in no mood to listen to conscience and eagerly bade it remember that he certainly had as good a right to decide what was proper to do as had that mr parker End of chapter twenty seven recording by tricia g